Chapter Forty One of Lorna Doon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Francisca. Lorna Doon by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Forty One. Cold Comfort. All things being full of flaw, all things being full of holes. The strength of all things is in shortness. If Sir Answer Doon had dwelt for half an hour upon himself, and an hour perhaps upon Lorna and me, we must both have wearied of him, and require change of air. But now I long to see and know a great deal more about him, and hope that he might not go to heaven for at least a week or more. However, he was too good for this world, as we say of all people who leave it, and I verily believe his heart was not a bad one after all. Evil he had done, no doubt, as evil had been done to him. Yet how many have done evil while receiving only good? Be that as it may, and not vexing a question, settled forever without our votes, let us own that he was, at least, a brave and courteous gentleman. And his loss aroused great lamentation, not among the dunes alone, and the women they had carried off, but also of the general public, and many even of the magistrates, for several miles round Exmoor. And this not only from fear lest one more wicked might succeed him, as appeared indeed too probable, but from true admiration of his strong will, and sympathy with his misfortunes. I will not deceive any one by saying that Sir Answer Doon gave, in so many words, his consent to my resolve about Lorna. This he never did, except by his speech last written down, from which, as he mentioned grandchildren, a lawyer perhaps might have argued it. Not but what he may have meant to bestow on us his blessing, only that he died next day, without taking the trouble to do it. He called indeed for his box of snuff, which was a very high thing to take, and which he never took without being in very good humour, at least for him. And though it would not go up his nostrils through the failure of his breath, he was pleased to have it there, and not to think of dying. "'Will your honour have it wiped?' I asked him very softly, for the brown appearance of it spoiled, to my idea, his white moustachio. But he seemed to shake his head, and I thought it kept his spirits up. I had never before seen any one do what all of us have to do some day and it greatly kept my spirits down, although it did not so very much frighten me. For it takes a man but a little while, his instinct being of death, perhaps, at least as much as of life, which accounts for his slaying his fellow man so, and every other creature. It does not take a man very long to enter into another man's death, and bring his own mood to suit it. He knows that his own is sure to come, and nature is fond of the practice. Hence it came to pass that I, after easing my mother's fears, and seeing a little to business, returned, as if drawn by a polar needle, to the deathbed of Sir Answer. There was some little confusion, people wanting to get away, and people trying to come in from downright curiosity, of all things the most hateful, and others making great to do, and talking of their own time to come, telling their own age, and so on. But every one seemed to think or feel that I had a right to be there, because the women took that view of it. As for Carver and Counsellor, they were minding their own affairs so as to win the succession, and never found it in their business, at least so long as I was there, to come near the dying man. He, for his part, never asked for any one to come near him, not even a priest, nor a monk or friar, but seemed to be going his own way, peaceful and well contented. Only the chief of the women said that from his face she believed and knew well that he liked to have me at one side of his bed, and Lorna upon the other. An hour or two ere the old man died, when only we two were with him, he looked at us both very dimly and softly, as if he wished to do something for us, but had left it now too late. Lorna hoped that he wanted to bless us, but he only frowned at that, and let his hand drop downward and crooked one knotted finger. "'He wants something out of the bed, dear,' Lorna whispered to me. "'See what it is, upon your side, there.' 
I followed the bent of his poor shrunken hand, and sought among the pilings, and there I felt something hard and sharp, and drew it forth and gave it to him. It flashed like the spray of a fountain upon us in the dark winter of the room. He could not take it in his hand, but let it hang as daisies do, only making Lorna see that he meant her to have it. Why, it is my necklace, Lorna cried in great surprise. My necklace he always promised me, and from which you have got the ring, John. But Grandfather kept it, because the children wanted to pull it from my neck. May I have it now, dear Grandfather? Not unless you wish, dear. Darling Lorna wept again, because the old man could not tell her, except by one very feeble nod, that she was doing what he wished. Then she gave to me the trinket, for the sake of safety, and I stowed it in my breast. He seemed to me to follow this, and to be well content with it. Before Sir Anser Dune was buried, the greatest frost of the century had set in, with its iron hand and step of stone on everything. How it came is not my business, nor can I explain it, because I have never watched the skies, as people now begin to do when the ground is not to their liking. Though of all this I know nothing, and less than nothing, I may say, because I ought to know something. I can hear what people tell me, and I can see before my eyes. The strong man broke three good pickaxes, ere they got through the hard brown sod streaked with little maps of grey where old Sir Anser was to lie upon his back, awaiting the darkness of the judgment day. It was in the little chapel yard. I will not tell the name of it, because we are now such Protestants that I might do it an evil turn. Only it was the little place where Lorna's aunt Sabina lay. Here was I, remaining long with a little curiosity, because some people told me plainly that I must be damned forever by a papist funeral. And here came Lorna, scarcely breathing through the thick of stuff around her, yet with all her little breath steaming on the air like frost. I stood apart from the ceremony in which, of course, I was not entitled, either by birth or religion, to bear any portion, and indeed it would have been wiser in me to have kept away altogether, for now there was no one to protect me among those wild and lawless men, and both Carver and the counsellor had vowed a fearful vengeance on me, as I heard from Gwenny. They had not dared to meddle with me while the chief lay dying nor was it in their policy, for a short time after that, to endanger their succession by an open breach with Lorna, whose tender age and beauty held so many of the youth in thrall. The ancient outlaw's funeral was a grand and moving sight, more perhaps from the sense of contrast than from that of fitness. To see those dark and mighty men, inured to all of sin and crime, reckless both of man and God, yet now with heads devoutly bent, clasped hands and downcast eyes following the long black coffin of their common ancestor to the place where they must join him when their sum of ill was done, and to see the feeble priest chanting over the dead form words the living would have laughed at, sprinkling with his little broom drops that could not purify, while the children, robed in white, swung their smoking censers slowly over the cold and twilight grave and after seeing all to ask with a shudder unexpressed, Is this the end that God intended for a man so proud and strong? Not a tear was shed upon him, except from the sweetest of all sweet eyes. Not a sigh pursued him home. Except in hot anger, his life had been cold and bitter and distant, and now a week had exhausted all the sorrow of those around him, a grief flowing less from affection than fear. Aged man will show his tombstone, mothers haste with their infants by it, children shrink from the name upon it, until in time his history shall lapse and be forgotten by all except the great judge and God. After all was over, I strode across the moors very sadly, trying to keep the cold away by virtue of quick movement. Not a flake of snow had fallen yet, all the earth was caked and hard, with a dry brown crust upon it. All the sky was banked with darkness, hard, austere and frowning. The fog of the last three weeks was gone, neither did any rhyme remain, 
but all things had a look of sameness and a kind of furzy colour. It was freezing hard and sharp, with a pierce wind to back it, and I had observed that the holy water froze upon Sir Ansa's coffin. One thing struck me with some surprise as I made off for our fireside, with a strong determination to heave an ash tree up the chimney place, and that was how the birds were going, rather than flying as they used to fly. All the birds were set in one direction, steadily journeying westward, not with any heat of speed, neither flying far at once, but all, as if on business bound, partly running, partly flying, partly fluttering along. Silently and without voice, neither pricking head nor tail, this movement of the birds went on. Even for a week or more, every kind of thrushes passed us, every kind of wild fowl, even plovers went away, and crows and snipes and woodcocks. And before half the frost was over, all we had in the snowy ditches were hares to tame so we could pet them, partridges that came to hand with a dry noise in their crops, Heath poles making cups of snow, and a few poor hopping red wings, flipping in and out the hedge, having lost the power to fly. And all the time their great black eyes set with gold around them seemed to look at any man for mercy and for comfort. Annie took a many of them, all that she could find herself and all the boys would bring her, and she made a great hutch near the fire in the back kitchen chimney place. Here, in spite of our old Betty, who sadly wanted to roast them, Annie kept some fifty birds, with bread and milk and raw chopped meat, and all the seed she could think of, and lumps of rotten apples, placed to tempt them in corners. Some got on, and some died off, and Annie cried for all that died, and buried them under the woodrick. But I do assure you it was a pretty thing, to see when she went to them in the morning. There was not a bird but knew her well after one day of comforting, and some would come to her hand and sit and shut one eye and look at her. Then she used to stroke their heads and feel their breasts and talk to them, and not a bird of them all was there but like to have it done to him, and I do believe they would eat from her hand things unnatural to them, lest she should be grieved and hurt by not knowing what to do for them. One of them was a noble bird, such as I had never seen before, of very fine bright plumage, and larger than a missile thrush. He was the hardest of all to please, and yet he tried to do his best. I have heard since then from a man who knows all about birds and beasts and fishes, that he must have been a Norwegian bird, called in his country a roller, who never comes to England but in the most tremendous winters. Another little bird there was, whom I longed to welcome home, and protect from enemies, a little bird no native to us, but then any native dearer. But lo, in the very night which followed old Sir Ensor's funeral, such a storm of snow began as never have I heard or read of, neither could have dreamt it. At what time of night it first began is more than I can say, at least from my own knowledge, for we all went to bed soon after supper, being cold and not inclined to talk. At that time the wind was moaning sadly, and the sky as dark as a wood, and the straw in the yard swirling round and round, the cows huddling into the great cow-house with their chins upon one another. But we, being blinder than they, I suppose, and not having had a great snow for years, made no preparation against the storm, except that the lambing ewes were in shelter. It struck me, as I lay in bed, that we were acting foolishly, for an ancient shepherd had dropped in and taken supper with us, and foretold a heavy fall and great disaster to livestock. He said that he had known a frost beginning, just as this had done, with a black east wind after days of raw cold fog, and then on the third night of the frost, at this very time of year, to wit on the 15th of December, such a snow set in as killed half of the sheep and many even of the red deer and the forest ponies. It was three score years ago, he said, footnote the frost of 1625, and cause he had to remember it inasmuch as two of his toes had been lost by frostnip while he dug out his sheep on the other side of the dunkery. 
Hereupon mother nodded at him, having heard from her father about it, and how three men had been frozen to death, and how badly their stockings came off from them. Remembering how the old man looked, and his manner of listening to the wind and shaking his head very ominously, when Annie gave him a glass of schnapps, I grew quite uneasy in my bed as the room got colder and colder, and I made up my mind, if it only pleased God not to send the snow till the morning, that every sheep and horse and cow, I, and even the poultry, should be brought in snug and with plenty to eat and fodder enough to roast them. Alas, what use of a man's resolves, when they come a day too late, even if they may avail a little, when they are most punctual. In the bitter morning I arose to follow out my purpose, knowing the time from the force of habit, although the room was so dark and grey. A not white light was on the rafters, such as I had never seen before, while all the length of the room was grisly, like the heart of a mouldy oat rick. I went to the window at once, of course, and at first I could not understand what was doing outside of it. It was faced due east, as I may have said, with a walnut tree partly sheltering it, and generally I could see the yard, and the woodrick, and even the church beyond. But now half the lattice was quite blocked up, as if plastered with grey lime, and little fringes like ferns came through where the joining of the lead was, and on the only undarkened part countless dots came swarming, clustering, beating with a soft low sound then gliding down in a slippery manner, not as drops of rain do, but each distinct from his neighbour. Inside the iron frame, which fitted, not to say too comfortably, and went along stonework, at least a peck of snow had entered, following its own bend and fancy, light as any cobweb. With some trouble and great care, lest the ancient frame should yield, I spread the letters open, and saw at once that not a moment must be lost to save our stock. All the earth was flat with snow, all the air was thick with snow. More than this no man could see, for all the world was snowing. I shut the window and dressed in haste, and when I entered the kitchen not even Betty, the earliest of all birds, was there. I raked the ashes together a little, just to see a spark of warmth, and then set forth to find John Fry, Jem Slocum, and Bill Dads. But this was easier thought than done for when I opened the courtyard door I was taken up to my knees at once, and the power of the drifting cloud prevented sight of anything. However, I found my way to the woodrick, and there got hold of a fine ash stake, cut by myself not long ago. With this I ploughed along pretty well, and thundered so hard in John Fry's door that he thought it was the dunes at least, and cocked his blunderbuss out of the window. John was very loath to come down when he saw the meaning of it, for he valued his life more than anything else, though he tried to make out that his wife was to blame. But I settled his doubts by telling him that I would have him on my shoulder naked unless he came in five minutes. Not that he could do much good, but because the other men would be sure to skulk if he set them the example. With spades and shovels and pitchforks and a round of roping, we four set forth to dig out the sheep, and the poor things knew that it was high time. End of chapter 41 Recording by Francisca Of Lorna Doom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Lorna Doom by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 42. The Great Winter. It must have snowed most wonderfully to have made that depth of covering in about eight hours. For one of Master Stickle's men, who had been out all the night, said that no snow began to fall until nearly midnight. And here it was, blocking up the doors, stopping the ways, and the water courses, and making it very much worse to walk than in a salt pit newly used. However, we trudged along in a line, I first, and the other men after me, trying to keep my track, 
but finding legs and strength not up to it. Most of all, John Fry was groaning, certain that his time was come, and sending messages to his wife and blessings to his children. For all this time it was snowing harder than it ever had snowed before, so far as man might guess at it, and the leading depth of the sky came down like a mine turned upside down on us. Not that the flakes were so very large, for I have seen much larger flakes in a shower of March, while sowing peas, but that there was no room between them, neither any relaxing, nor any change of direction. Watch, like a good and faithful dog, followed us very cheerfully, leaping out of the depth which took him over his back and ears already, even in the level places, while in the drifts he might have snuck to any distance out of sight, and never found his way up again. However, we helped him now and then, especially through the gaps and gateways, and so after a deal of floundering, some laughter, and a little swearing, we came all safe to the lower meadow where most of our flock was hurdled. But before, there was no flock at all, none, I mean, to be seen anywhere. Only at one corner of the field, by the eastern end, where the snow drove in a great white billow as high as a barn and as broad as a house. This great drift was rolling and curling beneath the violent blast, turfling and combing with rustling swirls, and carved, as in patterns of cornice, where the grooving chisel of the wind swept round. Ever and again the tempest snatched little whiffs from the channel edges, twirling them around and made them dance over the chime of the monster pile. Then let them lie like heron bones or the seams of sand where the tide has been, and all the while from the smothering sky, more and more fiercely at every blast, came the pelting, pitiless arrows winged with murky white and pointed with the barbs of frost. But although for people who had no sheep, the sight was a very fine one, so far at least as the weather permitted any sight at all. Yet for us, with our flock beneath it, this great mount had but little charm. Watch began to scratch at once and to howl along the sides of it. He knew that his charge was buried there and his business taken from him. But we four men set to in earnest digging with all our might and main, shoveling away at the great white pile and fetching it into the meadow. Each man made for himself a cave, scooping at the soft, cold flux, which slid upon him at every stroke, and throwing it out behind him in piles of castled fancy. At least we drove our tunnels in, for we worked indeed for the lives of us and all converging towards the middle, held our tools and listened. The other men heard nothing at all, or declared that they heard nothing, being anxious now to abandon the matter because of the chill in their feet and knees. But I said, Go, if you choose, all of you. I will work it out by myself, you pie crust. And upon that they gripped their shovels, being more or less of Englishmen, and the least drop of English blood is worth the best of any other when it comes to lasting out. But before we begin again, I laid my head well into the chamber, and there I hear a faint maha coming through some ells of snow, like a plaintive, buried hope, or at last appeal. I shouted aloud to cheer him up, for I knew what sheep it was, to wit, the most violent of all the weathers who had met me when i came home from london and been so glad to see me and then we all fell to again and very soon we hauled him out watch took charge of him at once with an air of the noblest patronage lying on his frozen fleece and licking all his face and feet to restore his warmth to him then figuring fighting tom jumped up at once 
and made a little butt at watch, as if nothing had ever ailed him, and then set off to a shallow place and looked for something to nibble on. Further in, and close under the bank, where they had huddled themselves for warmth, we found all the rest of the poor sheep packed as closely as if they were in a great pie. It was strange to observe how their vapor and breath and the moisture exuding from their wool had scooped, as if it were, a covered room for them, lined with a ribbon of deep yellow snow. Also the churned snow beneath their feet was as yellow as Gambol. Two or three of the weaker hoggets were dead, from want of air, and from pressure, but more than three score were as lively as ever, though cramped and stiff for a little while. However shall us get em home? John Fry asked, in great dismay, when we had cleared about a dozen of them, which we were forced to do very carefully, so as not to fetch the roof down. No manner a man and to drave em all through all the grit driftiness. You see to this place, John, I replied, as we leaned on our shovels a moment, and the sheep came rubbing around us. Let no more of them out for the present. They are better where to be. Watch here, boy, keep them. Watch came, with his little scud of a tail cocked as sharply as duty, and I set him at the narrow mouth of the great snow and tea. All the sheep slid it away and got closer, that the other sheep might be bitten first, as the foolish things imagined, whereas no good sheep dog even so much as lips a sheep to turn it to. Then, out of the outer sheep, all now snowed and frizzled like a lawyer's wig, I took the two finest and heaviest, and with one beneath my right arm and the other beneath my left, I went straight home to the upper sheppy and set them aside and fastened them. Sixty and six I took home in that way, two at a time on each journey, and the work grew harder and harder each time as the drifts of the snow were deepening. No other man should meddle with them. I was resolved to try my strength against the strength of the elements, and try it I did, ay, and proved it. A certain fierce delight burned in me, as the struggle grew harder, but rather would I die than yield, and at last I finished it. People talk of it to this day, but none can tell what the labor was, who have not felt that snow and wind. Of the sheep upon the mountain, and the sheep upon the western farm, and the cattle on the upper barrows, scarcely one in ten was saved. Do what we would for them, and this was not through any neglect, now that our wits were shopping, but from the pure impossibility of finding them at all. That great snow never ceased a moment for three days and nights. And then, when all the earth was filled, and the topmost hedges were unseen, and the trees broke down with way, wherever the wind had not lightened them, a brilliant sun broke forth and showed the loss of all our customs. All our house was quite snowed up, except where we had purged away by a dint of constant shoveling. The kitchen was as dark and darker than the cider cellar, and the long lines of ferro scallops ran even up to the chimney stacks. Several windows fell right inwards through the weight of the snow against them, and the few that stood bulged in and bent like an old bruised lanthorn. We were obliged to cook by candlelight. We were forced to read by candlelight. As for bacon, we could not do it because the oven was too chilly, and a load of faggots only brought a little wet down the sides of it. When the sun burst forth at last upon that world of white, what he brought was neither warmth, nor cheer, nor hope of softening, only a clearer shaft of cold, 
from the violent depths of sky long drawn alleys of white haze seemed to lean towards him yet such as he could not come down with any warmth remaining broad white curtains of the frost fog looped around the lower sky on the verge of hill and valley and above the laden trees only round the sun himself and the spot of heaven he claimed clustered a bright purple blue clear and calm and deep that night such a frost ensured as we had never dreamed of never read in ancient books or histories of frost bisher the kettle by the fire froze and the crock upon the hearth cheeks many men were killed and cattle ridge in their head ropes then i heard that fearful sound which never i had heard before neither since have heard except during that same winter the sharp yet solemn sound of trees burst open by the frost blow our great walnut lost three branches and has been dying ever since though growing meanwhile as the soul does and the ancient oak at the cross was rent and many score of ash trees but why should i tell all this the people who have not seen it as i have will only make faces and disbelieve till such another frost comes which perhaps may never be this terrible weather kept tom Fagus from coming near our house for weeks at which indeed i was not vexed a quarter so much as annie was for i had never half approved of him as a husband for my sister in spite of his purchase from squire bassett and the grant of the royal pardon it may be however that annie took the same view of my love for lorna and could not argue well of it but if so she held a peace though i was not so sparing for many things contributed to make me less good-humoured now that my real nature was and the very least of all these things would have been enough to make some people cross and rude and fractitious i mean the red and painful clapping of my face and hands from working in the snow all day and lying in the frost all night for being of a fair complexion and a ruddy nature and pretty plump withal and fed on plenty of hot victuals and always forced by my mother to sit near the fire than i wished it was wonderful to see how the cold ran revel on my cheeks and knuckles and i feared that lorna if it should ever please god to stop the snowing might take this for a proof of low and rustic blood and breeding and this i say was the smallest thing for it was far more serious that we were losing half our stock do all we would to shelter them even the horses in the stable mustered all together for the sake of breath and steaming had lawn icicles from their muscles almost every morning but of all the things the very gravest to my apprehension was the impossibility of hearing or having any token of or from my loved one not that those three days alone of snow tremendous as it was could have blocked the country so but that the sky had never ceased for more than two days at a time for four three weeks thereafter to pour fresh piles of fleecy mantle neither had the wind relaxed a single day from shaking them as a rule it snowed all day cleared up at night and froze intensely with the stars as bright as jewels earth spread out in luxurious twilight and the sounds in the air as sharp and crackling as artillery then in the morning snow again before the sun could come to help it mattered not what way the wind was often and often the veins went round and we hoped for change of weather the only change was that it seemed if possible 
to grow colder indeed after a week or so the wind would regularly box the compass as the sailors call it in the course of every day following where the sun should be as if to make a mark of him and this of course immensely added to the peril of the drifts because they shifted every day and no skill or care might learn them i believe it was on infamy morning or somewhere about that period when lizzie ran into the kitchen to me where i was thawing my goose geese with the dogs among the ashes the live dogs i mean not the iron ones for them we had given up long ago and having caught me by way of wander for generally i was out shoveling long before my young lady had her nightcap off she positively kissed me for the sake of warming her lips perhaps or because she had something proud to say you great fool john said my lady as annie and i used to call her on account of her airs and graces what a pity you never read john much use i should think in reading i answered though pleased with her condensation read i suppose with a roof coming in and only this chimney left sticking out of the snow the very time to read john said lizzie looking grander our worst troubles are the need whence knowledge can deliver us amen i cried out are you parson or clerk whichever you are good morning thereupon it was bent on my usual round a very small one nowadays but eliza took me with both hands and i stopped of course for i could not bear to shake the child even in play for a moment because her back was tender then she looked up at me with her beautiful eyes so large unhealthy and delicate and strangely shadowing outward as if to spread that meaning and she said now john this is no time to joke i almost froze in bed last night and ain't it like an icicle feel how cold my hands are now will you listen to what i have read about climates ten times worse than this and where none but clever men can live impossible for me to listen now i have hundreds of things to see to but i will listen after breakfast to your foreign climates child now attend to mother's hot coffee she looked a little disappointed but she knew what i had to do and after all she was not so utterly unreasonable although she did read books and when i had done my morning's work i listened to her patiently and it was out of my power to think that all she said was foolish for i knew common sense pretty well by this time whether it happened to be my own or any other person's if clearly laid before me and lizzie had a particular way of setting forth very clearly whatever she wished to express and enforce but the queerest part of it all was this that if she could but have dreamed for a moment what would be the first application made me by her lesson she would rather have bitten her tongue off than help me to my purpose she told me that in the arctic regions as they call some places a long way north where the great bear lies all across the heavens and no sun is up for whole months at a time and yet where people will go exploring out of pure contradiction and for the sake of novelty and love of being frozen that here they always had such winters as we were having now it never ceased to freeze she said and it never ceased to snow except when it was too cold and then all the air was choked with glittering spikes and a man's skin might come off of him before he could ask the reason nevertheless the people there although the snow was fifty feet deep and all their breath fell behind them frozen like a log of wood dropped from their shoulders 
yet they manage to get along and make the time of the year to each other by a little cleverness for seeing how the snow was spread lightly over everything covering up the hills and valleys and the foreskin of the sea they contrived a way to crown it and to glide like a flake along through the sparkle of the whiteness and the weefs of the wind's tossings and the ups and downs of cold any man might get along with a boat on either foot to prevent his sinking she told me how these boats were made very strong and very light of ribs with skin across them five feet long and one foot wide and turned up at each end even as a canoe is but she did not tell me nor did i give it a moment's thought myself how hard it was to walk upon them without early practice then she told me another thing equally useful to me although i would not let her see how much i thought about it and this concerned the use of sledges and their power of gliding and the lightness of their following all of which i could see at once through knowledge of our own farm sleds which we employ in lieu of wheels used in flatter districts when i had heard all this from her a mere chit of a girl as she was unfit to make a snowball even or to fry snow pancakes i looked down on her with amazement and began to wish a little that i had given more time to books but god shapes all our fitness and gives each man his meaning even as he guides the wavering lines of snow descending our eliza was meant for books our dear annie for loving and cooking i john reed for sheep and wrestling and the thought of lorna and mother to love all three of us and to make the best of her children and now if i must tell the truth as at every page i try to do though god knows it is hard enough i have felt through all this weather through my life was lorna's something of a satisfaction in doing duty to my kindness and best of mothers and to none but her for if you come to think of it a man's young love is very pleasant very sweet and tickling and takes him through the core of heart without his knowing how or why then he dwells upon it sideways without people looking and bills of all sorts of fancies grown hot with working so at his own imaginations so his love is a crystal goddess set upon an oblique and whoever will not bow the knee yet without glancing at her the lover makes it a sacred right either to kick or to stick him i am not speaking of me and lorna but of common people then if you come to think of it again lo or i will not say lo for no one can behold it only feel or but remember what a real mother is ever loving ever soft ever turning sin to goodness vices into virtues blind to all nine tenths of wrong through a telescope beholding though herself so nigh to them faintest decimal of promise even in her vilest child ready to thank god again as when her babe was born to her leaping as at kingdom come at a wandering syllable of gospel for her lost one all this our mother was to us and even more than all of this and hence i felt a pride and joy in doing my sacred duty towards her now that the weather compelled me and she was as grateful and delighted as if she had no more claim upon me than a stranger sheep might have yet from time to time i groaned within myself and by myself at thinking of my sad debarment from the sight of lorna and of all that might have happened to her 
now she had no protection. Therefore I fell to at once upon that hint from Lizzie, and being used to thatching work, in the making of traps, and so on, before very long I built myself a pair of strong and light snow shoes, framed with ash and ribbed with withy, with half tan calf skin scratched across, and in a sole to support my feet. At first I could not walk at all, but flounder about most piteously, catching one shoe in the other, and both of them in the snowdrifts, to the great amusement of the girls, who were come to look at me. But after a while I grew more expert, discovering what my errors were, and altering the inclination of the shoes themselves, according to a print which Lizzie found in a book of adventures. And this made such a difference, that I crossed the farmyard and came back again, though turning was the worst thing of all, without so much as falling once, or getting my staff entangled. But oh, the aching of my ankles, when I went to bed that night, I was forced to help myself upstairs with a couple of mop sticks, and I rubbed the joints with neat's foot oil, which comforted them greatly. And likely though I would have abandoned any further trial, but for Lizzie's ridicule and pretended sympathy, asking if the strong John Ridd would have old Betty to lean upon. Therefore I set to again with a fixed resolve not to notice pain or stiffness, but to warm them out of me. And sure enough, before dark that day, I could get along pretty freely especially improving every time after leaving off and resting the astonishment of poor john fry bill dads and jim slocum when they saw me coming down the hill upon them in the twilight where they were clearing the furzy rick and trussling it for cattle was more than i can tell you because they did not let me see it but ran away with one accord and floundered into a snowdrift. They believed, and so did everyone else, especially when I grew able to glide along pretty rapidly, that I had stolen Mother Meldrum's sleeves on which she was said to fly over the foreland at midnight every Saturday. Upon the following day I held some counsel with my mother, not liking to go without her permission, yet scarcely daring to ask for it. But here she disappointed me, on the right side of disappointment, saying that she had seen my pining, which she never could have done, because I had been too hard at work, and rather than watch me grieving so for somebody or other, who now was all in all to me, I might go upon my course, and God's protection go with me. At this I was amazed, because it was not at all like mother, and knowing how well I had behaved, ever since the time of our snowing up, I was a little moved to tell her that she could not understand me. However, my sense of duty kept me, and my knowledge of the catechism from saying such a thing as that, or even thinking twice of it. And so I took her at her word, which she was not prepared for, and telling her how proud I was of her trust in Providence, and how I could run in my new snowshoes. I took a short pipe in my mouth, and started forth accordingly. End of chapter 42 Recording by Daisy 55Lorna Doom. This is a Liberox recording. All Liberox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Liberox.org. Recording by Daisy55.
Lorna Doom by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter forty three. Not too soon. When I started on my road across the hills and valleys, which now were pretty much alike, the utmost I could hope to do was to gain the crest of hills and look into the Doom Glen. Hence, I might at least describe whether Lorna still was safe by the six nests still remaining and the view of the captain's house. When I was come to the open country, far beyond the sheltered homestead, and in the full blunt of the wind, the keen blast of the cold broke on me and the mighty breath of snow. Moor and high land, field and common, cliff and vale, and water crust, over all the rolling folds of misty white were flung. There was nothing square or jagged left. There was nothing perpendicular. All the rugged lines were eased, and all the breaches smoothly fur curved. Curves and mounds and rounded heavens took the place of rock and stump, and all the country looked as if a woman's hand had been on it. Through the sparkling breath of white, which seemed to glance my eyes away, and outside the humps of laden trees, bowing their backs like a woodman, I contrived to get along, half sliding and half walking, in places where a plain shotted man must have sunk, and waited freezing till the thaw could come to him. For although there had been such violent frost, every night upon the snow, the snow itself, having never thawed, even for an hour, had never coated over. Hence it was as soft and light as if all had fallen yesterday, in places where no drift had been but rather off than on to them three feet was the least of depth but where the wind had chased it round or in a draught led like a funnel or anything opposed it there you might very safely say that it ran up to twenty feet or thirty or even fifty and i believe sometimes a hundred at last i got to my spy hill as i had been begun to call it although i never should have known it but for what it looked on and even to know this last again required all the eyes of love so ever sharp and vigilant for all the beautiful glen dune shaped from out the mountains as if on purpose for the dunes and looking in the summer time like a sharp cut vase of green now was besnowed half up the sides and at either end so that it was more like the white basins wherein we boil plum puddings not a patch of grass was there not a black branch of a tree all was white and the little river flowed beneath an arch of snow if it managed to flow at all now this was a great surprise to me not only because i believed glen doon to be a place outside our frost but also because i thought perhaps that it was quite impossible to be cold near lorna and now it struck me all at once that perhaps her eel was frozen as mine had been for the last three weeks with crying embers around it and perhaps her window would not shut any more than mine would and perhaps she wanted blankets this idea worked me up to such a chill of sympathy that seeing no dunes now and about and doubting if any guns would go off in this state of the weather and knowing that no man could catch me up except with shoes like mine i even resolved to slide the cliffs and bravely go to lorna it helped me much of this in this resolve that the snow came on again thick enough to blind a man who had not spent his time among it as i had done for days and days therefore i took my neat's foot oil which now was clogged like honey and rubbed it hard into my leg joints so far as i could reach them and then i set my back and elbows well against the snowdrift hanging far down the cliff and saying some of the lord's prayer threw myself on providence before there was time to think or dreamed i landed very beautifully upon a ridge of run-up snow in a quiet corner my good shoes or boots preserved me from going far beneath it though one of them was sadly stained where a grub had gnawed the ash in the early summer time having set myself all right and being in good spirits i made boldly across the valley where the snow was furrowed hard 
being now afraid of nobody. If Lorna had looked out of the window, she would not have known me, with those boots upon my feet, and a well-cleaned sheepskin over me, bearing my own, J.R., in red, just between my shoulders, but covered now in snowflakes. The house was partly drifted up, though not so much as ours was, and I crossed the little stream almost without knowing that it was under me. At first, being pretty safe from interference from the other huts, by virtue of the blinding snow and the difficulty of walking, I examined all the windows, but these were coated so with ice, like ferns and flowers and dazzling stars, that no one could so much as guess what might be inside of them. Moreover, I was afraid of prying narrowly into them, as it was not a proper thing where a maiden might be, only I wanted to to know just this, whether she were there or not. Taking nothing by this movement, I was forced, much against my will, to venture to the door and knock in a hesitating manner, not being sure but what my answer might be the mouth of carbine. However, it was not so, for I heard a pattering of feet and a whispering going on, and then a shrill voice through the keyhole asking, Who's there? only me john reed i answered upon which i heard a little laughter and a little sobbing or something that was like it and then the door was opened about a couple of inches with a bar behind it still and then the little voice went on put thy finger in young man with the old ring on it but mind thee if it be the wrong one thou shalt never draw back again laughing at Gwenny's mighty threat i showed my finger in the opening upon which she let me in and barred the door again like lightning what is the meaning of all this Gwenny? i asked as i slipped about on the floor for that i could not stand there firmly with my great snowshoes on man and enough and bad man and too the cornish girl made answer us be shut in here and starving and don't let nobody upon us. I wish they were good to eat, young man. I can manage most of thee. I was so frightened by her eyes, full of wolfish hunger, that I could only say, Good God! Having never seen the like before. Then drew I forth a large piece of bread, which I had brought in case of accidents, and placed it in her hands. She leaped at it as a starving dog leaps at sight of a sufferer, and she set her teeth in it, and then withheld it from her lips with something very like an oath at her own vile greediness, and then away around the corner with it, no doubt for her young mistress. I meanwhile was occupied to the best of my ability in taking my snowshoes off, yet wondering how much within myself why Lorna did not come to me. But presently I knew the cause, for Gwenny called me, and I ran and found my darling quite unable to say so much as, John, how are you? Between the hunger and the cold and the excitement of my coming, she had fainted away and lay back in a chair, as white as the snow around us. In betwixt her delicate lips, Gwenny was thrusting with all her strength the hard brown crust of the rye bread which she had snatched from me so get water or get snow i said don't you know what fainting is you very stupid child never heard of cornwall she answered trusting still to the bread be on the same as bleeding it will be directly if you go on squeezing away with that crust so eat a piece i got some more leave my darling now to me hearing that i had some more the starving girl could resist no longer, but tore it in two and had swallowed half before I had coaxed my Lorna back to sense and hope and joy and love. I never expected to see you again. I had made up my mind to die, John, and to die without your knowing it. As I repelled this fearful thought in a manner highly fortifying the tender hue flowed back again into her famished 
lips and cheeks and a softer brilliance glistened from the depth of her dark eyes she gave me one little shrunken hand and i could not help a tear for it after all mistress lorna i said pretending to be gay for a smile might do her good you do not love me as guinea does for she even wanted to eat me <laughs> and shall afore i have done young man guinea answered laughing you come in here with them red chicks and make us think of sirloin eat up your old bit of brown bread guinea it is not good enough for your mistress bless her heart i have something here such as she never tasted the like of being in such appetite look here lorna smell it first i have had it ever since twelfth day and kept it all the time for you and he made it that is enough to warn it good cooking and then i showed my great mince pie in a bag of tissue paper and i told them how the mince meat was made of golden pippins finely shred with the undercut of the sirloin and spice and fruit accordingly and far beyond my knowledge but lorna would not touch a morsel until she had thanked god for it and given me the kindest kiss and put a piece in gwenny's mouth i have eaten many things myself with very great enjoyment and keen perception of their merits and some thanks to god for them but i never did enjoy a thing that has found its way but between my own lips half or even a quarter as much as i now enjoy holding and beholding lorna sitting proudly upwards to show that she was faint no more entering into that mince pie and moving all her pearls of teeth inside her little mouth place exactly as i told her for i was afraid lest she should be too fast in going through it and cause herself more damage so than she got of nourishment but i had no need to fear at all and lorna could not help laughing at me for thinking that she had no self-control some creatures require a deal of food i myself among the number and some can do with very little making no doubt the best of it i have often noticed that the plumpest and most perfect women never eat so hard and fast as the skinny and three-cornered ones these last be often ashamed of it and eat most when the men be absent hence it came to pass that lorna being the loveliest of all maidens had as much as she could do to finish her own half a pie whereas guinea carfax though generous more than greedy ate of hers without winking after finishing the brown loaf and then i begged to know the meaning of this state of things the meeting is sad enough said lorna and i see no way out of it we are both to be starved until i let them do what they like with me that is to say until you choose to marry carver dune and be slowly killed by him slowly no john quickly i'd hate him so intensely that less than a week would kill me no doubt of that said gwenny oh she hates him nicely then but not half so much as i do i told them that this state of things could be endured no longer on which point they agreed with me but saw no means to help it for even if lorna could make up her mind to come away with me and live at plowers barrows farm under my good mother's care as i had urged so often behold the snow was all around us heaped as high as mountains and how could any delicate maiden ever get across it then i spoke with a strange tingle upon both sides of my heart knowing that this understanding was a serious one for all and might burn our farm down if i warrant to take you safe and without much fright or hardship lorna will you come with me to be sure i will dear said my beauty with a smile and a glance to follow i have small alternative to starve or go with you john 
guinea. Have you courage for it? Will you come with your young mistress? Will I stay? cried guinea, in a voice that settled it. And so we began to arrange about it, and I was much excited. It was useless now to leave it any longer. If it could be done at all, it could not be too quickly done. It was the counselor who had ordered, after all other schemes had failed, that his niece should have no food until she would obey him. He had strictly watched the house, taking turns with Carver to ensure that none came nigh in bearing fruit or comfort. But this evening they had thought it needless to remain on guard, and it would have been impossible because themselves were busy offering high festival to all the valley in right of their own commandership. And Guinea said that nothing made her so nearly mad with appetite as the account she received from a woman of all the dishes preparing. Nevertheless, she had answered bravely. Go and tell the counselor, and go and tell the carver who sent you to spy upon us that we shall have a finer dish than any set before em. and so in truth they did although so little dreaming of it for no doom that was ever born however much of a carver might vie with our annie for man's meat now while we sat reflecting much and talking a good deal more in spite of all the cold for I was never in a hurry to go when I had Lorna with me. She said in her silvery voice, which always led me so along as if I were a slave to a beautiful bell. Now, John, we are wasting time, dear. You have praised my hair till it curls with pride, and my eyes till you cannot see them, even if they are brown diamonds, which I have heard for the fiftieth time at least though I never saw such a jewel. Don't you think it is high time to put your snowshoes, John? Certainly, Lord, I answered, till we have settled something more. I was so cold when I came in, and now I am as warm as a cricket. And so are you, you lively soul, though you are not upon my heart yet. Remember, John, said Lorna, nesting for a moment to me, the severity of the weather makes a great difference between us and you must never take advantage i quite understand all that dear and the harder it freezes the better while that understanding continues now do try to be serious i'll try to be serious and i have been trying fifty times and could not bring you to it john Although I am sure the situation, as the counselor says at the beginning of a speech, the situation, to say the least, is serious enough for anything. Come, Gwenny, imitate him. Gwenny was famed for her imitation of the counselor making a speech, and she began to shake her hair and mount upon a footstool, but I really could not have this, though even Lorna ordered it. The truth was that my darling maiden was in such wild spirits at seeing me so unexpected and at the prospect of release and of what she had never known, quiet life and happiness, that like a warm and loving nature she could scarcely control herself. Come to this frozen window, John, and see them light the stack fire. They will little know who looks at them. Now be very good, John. Your stay in that corner, dear, and I will stand on this side and try to breathe yourself a peephole through the lovely spears and banner. Oh, you don't know how to do it? I must do it for you. Breathe three times, like this and that, and then you rub it with your fingers before it has time to freeze again. All this she did so beautifully with her lips put up like cherries, and her fingers bent half back, as only girls can bend them, and her little waist thrown out against the white of the snowed up window, that I made her do it three times over, and I stopped her every time, and let it freeze again, so that she might be the longer. Now I knew that all her love was mine, every bit as much as mine was hers, yet I must have her to show it dwelling upon every proof, lengthening out all certainty. 
perhaps the jealous heart is loath to own a life worth twice its own. Be that as it may, I know that we thawed the window nicely. And then I saw, far down the stream, or rather down the bed of it, for there was no stream visible, a little form of fire arising, red and dark and flickering. Presently it caught on something, and went upward boldly, and then it struck into many forks, and then it fell and rose again. Do you know what all that is, John? asked Lorna, smiling cleverly at the manner of my staring. How on earth should I know? Pappas burn Protestants in the flesh, and Protestants burn Pappas in effigy, as we mark them. Lorna! Are they going to burn any one tonight? <laughs> no, dear. I must read you of these things. I see that you are bigoted. The dunes are firing dunkery bacon to celebrate their new captain. But how could they bring it here through the snow if they have sledges? I can do nothing. They brought it before the snow began. The moment poor grandfather was gone, even before his funeral, the young men, having none to check them, began at once upon them. They had always bore a grudge against it, not that it ever did them harm, but because it seemed so insolent. Can't a gentleman go home without a smoke behind him? I have often heard them saying, and though they have done it, no serious harm since they threw the firemen on the fire many many years ago they have often promised to bring it here for their candle and now they have done it ah oh, now look the tar is kindled though lorna took it so in joke i looked upon it very gravely knowing that this heavy outrage to the feelings of the neighborhood would cause more stir than a hundred sheep stolen or a score of houses sacked not of course that the bacon was of the smallest use to any one neither stopped anybody from stealing nay rather it was like the parish nil which begins when all is over and depresses all the survivors yet i knew that we valued it and were proud and spoke of it as a mighty institution and even more than that our vestry had voted within the last two years seven shillings and sixpence to pay for it in proportion with other parishes and one of the men who attended to it or at least who was paid for doing so was our jim slocum's grandfather however in spite of all my regrets the fire went up very merrily blazing red and white and yellow as it leaped on different things and the light danced on the snow drifts with a mystic lilac hue i was astonished at its burning in such mighty depths of snow beginney said that the wicked men had been three days hard at work clearing as it were a cockpit for their fire to have its way and now they had a mighty pile which must have covered five land yards square heaped up to a godly height and eager to take fire in this i saw a great obstacle to what i wished to manage for when this pyramid should be kindled thoroughly and pouring light and blazes round would not all the valley be like a white room full of candles thinking this i was half inclined to abide my time for another night and then my second thoughts convinced me that I would be a fool in this. For lo, what an opportunity! All the dunes would be drunk, of course, in about three hours' time, and getting more and more in drink as the night went on. As for the fire, it must sink in about three hours or more, and only cast uncertain shadows friendly to my purpose. And then the outlaws must cower around it as the cold increased on them, helping the way of the liquor and their jollity any noise would be cheered as a false alarm most of all and which decided once for all my action when these wild and reckless villains should be hot with ardent spirits what was door or wall to stand betwixt 
them in my Lorna. This thought quickened me so much that I touched my darling reverently, and told her in a few short words how I helped to management. Sweetest, in two hours' time I shall be again with you. Keep the bar up and have Guinea ready to answer anyone. You are safe while you are dining, dear, and drinking heathers and all that stuff, and before they have done with that, I shall be again with you. Have everything you care to take in, and a very little compass, and Guinea must have no baggage. I shall knock loudly, and then wait a little, and then knock twice, very softly. With this, I folded her in my arms, and she looked frightened at me, not having perceived her danger, and then I told Guinea over again what I had told her mistress. But she only nodded her head and said, Young man, go and teach thy grandmother. End of chapter 43 Recording by Daisy 55 Lorna Doom. This is a Liver Rocks recording. All Liver Rocks recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LiverRocks.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Lorna Doom by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 44. Brought home at last. To my great delight, I found that the weather, not often friendly to lovers and lately seeming so hostile, had in the most important matter done me a signal service. For when I had promised to take my love from the power of those wretchedses, the only way of escape apparent lay through the main doom gate. For though I might climb the cliffs myself, especially with the snow to aid me, I durst not try to fetch Lorna up them, even if she were not half starved as well as partly frozen, and as for Guinea's door, as we called it, that is to say, the little inches from the wooden hollow, it was snowed up long ago to the level of the hills around. Therefore, I was at my wit's end how to get them out, the passage by the dune gate being long and dark and difficult and leading to such a weary circuit among the snowy moors and hills. But now, being homeward bound by the shortest possible track, I slipped along between the bonfire and the boundary cliffs, where I found a carved way of snow behind a sort of avalanche, so that if the dunes had been keeping watch, which they were not doing but reveling, they could scarcely have discovered me. And when I came to my old ascent, where I had often scaled the cliff and made across the mountains, it struck me that I would just have a look at my first and painful ex entrance, to wit, the water slide. I never for a moment imagined that this could help me now, for I never had dared to descend it, even in the fairest weather. Still, I had a curiosity to know what my old friend was like, and was so much snow upon him, but, to my very great surprise, there was scarcely any snow there at all, though plenty curling high overhead from the cliff, like bolsters over it. Probably the sweeping of the northeast wind up the narrow chasm had kept the showers from blocking it, although the water had no pow power under the bitter grip of frost. All my water slide was now less a slide than path of ice, furrowed where the waters ran out of fluted ridges, seamed where wind had tossed and combed them, even while congealing and crossed with little steps whenever the freezing torrent lingered and here and there the ice was fibred with the trail of sludge weed slanted from the side and mattered so as to make rest in place. Lo, it was easy track and channel, as if for the very purpose made, down which I could glide my sled with lawn and sitting in it, there were only two things to be feared. One least the rows of snow above should fall in and bury us, the other least we should rush too fast, and so be carried headlong into the black whirlpool at the bottom, the middle of which was still unfrozen, and looking more horrible by the contrast. Against this danger I made provisions, by fixing a stout bar across, but the other we must take our chance, 
and trust ourselves to providence i hastened home at my utmost speed and told my mother for god's sake to keep the house up till my return and to have plenty of fire blazing and plenty of water boiling and food enough hot for a dozen people and the best bed aired with the warm pan dear mother smiled softly at my excitement though her own was not much less i am sure and enhanced by some sore anxiety then i gave very strict directions to annie and praised her a little and kissed her and i even endeavoured to flatter eliza lest she should be disagreeable after this i took some brandy both within and about me the former because i had sharp work to do and the latter in fear of whatever might happen in such great cold to to my comrades also i carried some other provisions grieving much at their coldness and then i went to the upper lay hay and took out our new light pony sled which had been made almost as much for pleasure as for business though god only knows how our girls could have found any pleasure in bumping along so on the snow however it ran as sweetly as if it had been made for it yet i durst not take the pony with it in the first place because it's his hoofs would break through the ever-shifting surface of the light and piling snow and secondly because these ponies coming from the forest have a dreadful trick of neighing and most of all in frosty weather therefore i girded my own body with a dozen turns of hay rope twisting both the ends in under at the bottom of my breast and winding the hay on the skew a little that the hen pin thong might not slip between and so cut me in the drawing i put a good piece of spare rope in the sled and the cross seat with the back to it which was stuffed with my own wool as well as two or three fur coats and then just as i was starting out came annie in spite of the cold panting for fear of missing me and with nothing on her head but a land horn in one hand oh john here is the most ex wonderful thing mother has never shown it before and i can't think how she could make up her mind she had gotten it in a great well of cupboard with camphor and spirits and lavender lizzie says it is a most magnificent seal skin cloak worth fifty pounds or a fathering at any rate it is soft and warm i said very calmly flinging it into the bottom of the sled tell mother i will put it over lorna's feet lorna's feet oh you great fool cried annie for the first time reveling me over her shoulders and be proud you very stupid john it is not enough for her feet i answered with strong emphasis but don't tell mother i said so annie only thank her very kindly with that i drew my traces hard and set my ashen staff into the snow and struck out with my best foot foremost the best one at snowshoes i mean and the sled came after me as light as a dog might follow and annie with the lanthorn seemed to be left behind and waiting like a pretty lamp post the full moon rose as bright behind me as a pattern of pure silver casting on the snow long shadows of the few things left above bird and rock and shaggy foreland and the laboring trees in the great white desolation distance was a mocking vision hills looked nigh and the valleys far when hills were far and valleys nigh and the misty breath of frost piercing through the ribs of rock striking through the pit of trees creeping to the heart of man lay along the hollow places like a serpent slouching even as my own gaunt shadow traversed it as if i were a moonlight's daddy long legs went before me down a slope even i the shadow's master who had tried in vain to cough when coughing brought good licorice felt a pressure on my bosom and a husking in my throat however i went on quietly 
and at a very tight speed, being only too thankful that the snow had ceased, and no wind as yet arisen, and from the ring of low white vapors girding all the verge of sky, and from the rosy blue above, and the shafts of starlight set upon a quivering bow, as well as from the moon itself and the light behind it, having learned the signs of frost from its bitter twinges, I knew that we should have a night as keen as ever England felt. Nevertheless, I had work enough to keep me warm if I managed it. The question was, could I contrive to save my darling from it? Daring not to risk my sled by any fall from the valley cliffs, I dragged it very carefully up the steep incline of ice through the now chasm and so to the very brink and verge where first i had seen my lorna in the fishing days of boyhood as i then had a trident fork for sticking of the loaches so i now had a strong ash stake to lay across from rock to rock and break the speed of descending with this i moored the sled quite safely at the very lip of the chasm where all was now substantial ice green and black in the moonlight and i then i set off up the valley skirting along one side of it the stack fire still was burning strongly but with more of heat than blaze and many of the younger dunes were playing on the verge of it the children making rings of fire and their mothers watching them all the grave and revered warriors having heard of ruthenism were inside of log and stone in the two lowest houses with enough of candles burning to make our list of sheep come short all these i passed without the smallest risk or difficulty walking up the channel of drift which i spoke of once before and then i crossed with more of care and to the door of lorna's house and made the sign and listened after taking my snowshoes off but no one came as I expected, neither could I ask a light, and I seemed to hear a faint low sound, like the moaning of the snow wind. Then I knocked again more loudly, with a knocking at my heart, and receiving no answer, set all my power at once against the door. In the moment it flew inwards, and I glided along the passage with my feet still slippery. There in Lorna's room I saw, by the moonlight flowing in, a sight which drove me beyond sense. Lorna was behind a chair, crouching in the corner, with her hands up, and a crucifix, or something that looked like it. In the middle of the room lay Guinea Carfax, stupid, yet with one hand clutching the ankle of a struggling man. Another man stood above my Lorna, trying to draw the chair away. In a moment I had him round the waist and he went out the window with a mighty crash of glass luckily for him that window had no bars like some of them then i took the other man by the neck and he could not plead for mercy i bore him out of the house as lightly as i would bear a baby yet squeezing his throat a little more than i fain would do to an infant by the bright moonlight i saw i carried marwood d witcher hazel for his father's sake, I spared him, and because he had been my schoolfellow, but with every muscle of my body strung with indignation, I cast him, like a skittle, from me into a snowdrift, which closed over him. Then I looked for the other fellow, tossed through Lorna's window, and found him lying stunned and bleeding, neither able to groan yet. Charlie Worth doom, in, in his gushing blood, did not much mislead me. It was no time to linger now. I fastened my shoes in a moment, and caught up my own darling with her head upon my shoulder, where she whispered faintly, and telling Guinea to follow me, or else I would come back for her if she could not walk the snow. I ran the whole distance to my sled, caring not who might follow me. Then by the time I had set up Lorna, beautiful and smiling, with the seal skin cloaked all over her, sturdy guinea came along, having trudged in the track of my snowshoes, although with two bags on the back. I set her in besides her mistress, to support her and keep warm, and then with one look back at the glen, which had been so long my home of heart, 
I hung behind the sled and launched it down the steep and dangerous way. Though the cliffs were black above us, and the road unseen in front, and a great white grave of snow might at a single word come down, Lorna was as calm and happy as an infant in its bed. She knew that I was with her, and when I told her not to speak, she touched my hand in silence. Guinea was in a much greater fright, having never seen such a thing before, neither knowing what it is to yield to pure love's confidence. I could hardly keep her quiet without making a noise myself. With my staff from rock to rock and my weight thrown backwards, I broke the sleds too rapid way and brought my grown love safely out by the self-same road which first had led me to her girlish fancy and my boyish slavery. Unpursued, yet looking back as if someone must be after us, we skirted around the black whirling pool and gained the meadows beyond it. Here there was hard collar work, the track being all uphill and rough, and Guinea wanted to jump out to lighten the sled and to push behind. But I would not hear of it, because it was now so deadly cold, and I feared that Lorna might get frozen without having Guinea to keep her warm. And after all, it was the sweetest labor I had ever known in all my life to be sure that I was pulling Lorna and pulling her to our own farmhouse. Guinea's nose was touched with frost before we had gone much farther, because she would not keep it quiet and snug between the seal skin, and here I had to stop in the moonlight, which was very dangerous, and rub it with clove of snow, as Elijah had taught me, and Guinea scolding all the time as if myself had frozen it. Lorna was now so far oppressed with all the troubles of the evening and joy that followed them, as well as the piercing cold and difficulty of breathing, that she lay quite motionless, like fairest wax in the moonlight. When we stole a glance at her beneath the dark folds of the cloak, and I thought that she was falling into the heavy snow sleep, whence there is no awakening. Therefore, I drew my traces tight and set my whole strength to the business and we slipped along at a merry pace although with many joltings which must have sent my darling out into the cold snow drifts but for the short strong arm of guinea and so in about an hour's time in spite of many hindrances we came home to the old courtyard and all the dogs lulled us my heart was quivering and my cheek as hot as the dunes bonfire with a wondering both what Lorna would think of our farmyard and what my mother would think of her. Upon the former subject my anxiety was wasted, for Lorna neither saw a thing, nor even opened her heavy eyes as to what mother would think of her. She was certain not to think at all until she had cried over her. And so indeed it came to pass. Even at this length of time, I can hardly tell it, although so bright before my mind, because it moves my heart so. The sled was at the open door, with only Lorna in it, for Guinea Carfax had jumped out and hung back in the clearing, given any reason rather than the only true one, that she would not be intruding. At the door were all our people. First, of course, Betty Muxworthy, teaching me how to draw the sled as if she had been born in it, and flourishing with great broom whenever a speck of snow lay. Then dear Annie and old Molly, who was very quiet and counted almost for nobody, and behind them mother, looking as if she wanted to come first, but doubted how the manners lay. In the distance Lizzie stood, fearful of encouraging, but unable to keep of it. Betty was going to poke her broom right in under the sealskin cloak, where Lorna lay unconscious, and where her precious breath hung frozen like a silver cobweb. But I caught up Betty's broom and flung it clean away over the corn chamber, and then I put the others by and fetched my mother forward. You shall see her first, I said. Is she not your daughter? Hold the light there, Annie. Dear mother's hands were quick and trembling as she opened the shining folds, and there she saw my Lorna sleeping with her black hair all disheveled, and she bent and kissed her forehead, and only said, God bless her, John. 
and then she was taken with violent weeping, and I was forced to hold her. Us made titch of her now, I reckon, said Betty, in her most jealous way. Annie, take her by the head, and I take her by the tosum. No taming to stand here like girl cocks. Now don't take on those old missus. There'll be von invasion to zee low, but her be a booty. With this, they carried her into the house. Betty chattering all the while, and going on now about Lorna's hands and the others crowding around her, so that I thought I was not one and among so many women, and should only get the worst of it, and perhaps do harm to my darling. Therefore I went and brought Guinea in, and gave her a spot full of bacon and peas, and an iron spoon to feed, eat it with, which she did right heartily. Then I asked her how she could have been such a fool as to let those two vile fellows into the house where Lorna was, and she accounted for it so naturally that I could only blame myself, for my agreement had been to give one loud knock, if you happen to remember, and after that two little knocks. Well, these two drunken rules had come, and one, being very drunk indeed, had given a great thump, and then nothing more to do with it, and the other, being three-fourths or three-quarters drunk, had followed his lead, as one might say, but feebly and making two of it. Whereupon Lorna jumped and declared that her John was there. All this Guinea told me shortly between the wiles of eating, and even while she licked the spoon, and then there came a message for me that my love was sensible, and was seeking all around for me. Then I told Guinea to hold her tongue, whatever she did among us, and not to trust to woman's words, and she told me they were all liars, as she had found out long ago, and the only thing to believe in was an honest man when found. Thereupon I could have kissed her as a sort of tribute, liking to be appreciated, yet the peas upon her lips made me think about it, and though it's fated to action, so I went to see my dear. That sight I shall not forget, till my dying head falls back, and my breast can lift no more. I now know whether I were then more blessed or harrowed by it. For in the settle was my Lorna, propped with pillows around her, and her clear hand spread sometimes to the blazing fireplace. In her eyes no knowledge was of anything around her, neither in her neck the sense of leaning towards anything. Only both her lovely hands were entreating something, to spare her, or to love her, and the lines of supplication quivered in her sad white face. I'll go away, except my mother, I said very quietly, but so that I would be obeyed and everybody knew it. Then mother came to me alone, and she said, The frost is in her brain. I have heard of this before, John. Mother, I will have it out, was all that I could answer. Her. Leave her to me altogether. Only you sit there and watch for I felt that Lorna knew me, and no other soul but me, and that if not interfered with it, she would soon come home to me. Therefore I sat gently by her, leaving nature, as it were, to her own good time and will, and presently the glance that watched me, as at distance and in doubt, began to flutter and to brighten and to deepen into kindness, them to beam with trust and love, and then with gathering tears to falter, and in shame to turn away. But the small entreating hands found their way, as if by instinct, to my great projecting palms, and trembled there, and rested there. For a little while we lingered thus, neither wishing to move away, neither caring to look beyond the presence of the other, both alike so full of hope and comfort and true happiness, if only the world would let us be. And then a little sob disturbed us, 
and mother tried to make believe that she was only coughing but lorna guessing who she was jumped up so very rashly that she almost set her frock on fire from the great ash log and away she ran to the old oak chair where mother was by the clock case pretending to be knitting and she took the work from my mother's hands and laid them both upon her head kneeling humbly and looking up god bless you my fair mistress said mother bending nearer and then as lorna's glaze prevailed god bless you my sweet child and so she went to my mother's heart by the very nearest road even as she had come to mine i mean the road of pity soothed by grace and youth and gentleness end of chapter 44 recording by daisy 55《45 of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 45 A Change Long Needed. Jeremy Stickles was gone south ere ever the frost set in for the purpose of mustering forces to attack the Doone Glen. But now this weather had put a stop to every kind of movement for even if men could have borne the cold, they could scarcely be brought to face the perils of the snowdrifts. And to tell the truth, I cared not how long this weather lasted, so long as we had enough to eat and could keep ourselves from freezing. Not only that I did not want Master Stickles back again to make more disturbances, but also that the dunes could not come prowling after Lorna while the snow lay piled between us with the surface soft and dry. Of course, they would very soon discover where their lawful queen was, although the track of sled and snowshoes had been quite obliterated by another shower before the revellers could have grown half as drunk as they intended. But Marwood de Wickerhauser, who had been snowed up among them, as Gwenny said, after helping to strip the beacon, that young squire was almost certain to have recognised me and to have told vile Carver. And it gave me no little pleasure to think how mad that Carver must be with me for robbing him of the lovely bride whom he was starving into matrimony. However, I was not pleased at all with the prospect of the consequences, but set all hands on to thresh the corn ere the dunes could come and burn the ricks, for I knew that they could not come yet, inasmuch as even a forest pony could not traverse the country, much less the heavy horses needed to carry such men as they were. And hundreds of the forest ponies died in this hard weather, some being buried in the snow, and more of them starved for want of grass. Going through this state of things, and laying down the law about it, subject to correction, I very soon persuaded Lorna that for the present she was safe, and, which made her still more happy, that she was not only welcome, but as gladdening to our eyes as the flowers of May. Truly, so far as regarded myself, this was not a hundredth part of the real truth, and even as regarded others I might have said it ten times over. For Lorna had so won them all by her kind and gentle ways, and her mode of hearkening to everybody's trouble, and replying without words, as well as by her beauty and simple grace of all things, that I could almost wish sometimes the rest would leave her more to me. But mother could not do enough, and Annie almost worshipped her, and even Lizzie could not keep her bitterness towards her, especially when she found that Lorna knew as much of books as need be. As for John Fry and Betty and Molly, they were a perfect plague when Lorna came into the kitchen, for betwixt their curiosity to see a live dune in the flesh, when certain not to eat them, and their high respect for birth, with or without honesty, and their intense desire to know all about Master John's sweetheart, dropped, as they said, from the snow-clouds, and most of all, their admiration of a beauty such as never even their angels could have seen. Betwixt and between all this, I say, there was no getting the dinner cooked with Lorna in the kitchen. And the worst of it was that Lorna took the strangest of all strange fancies for this very kitchen, and it was hard to keep her out of it. Not that she had any special bent for cooking, as our Annie had, rather indeed the contrary, for she liked to have her food ready cooked, but that she loved the look of the place, and the cheerful fire burning, and the racks of bacon to be seen, and the richness, and the homeliness, and the pleasant smell of everything. And who knows but what she may have liked, as the very best of maidens do, to be admired now and then, between the times of business. 
Therefore, if you wanted Lorna, as I was always sure to do God knows how many times a day, the very sorest place to find her was our own old kitchen. Not gossiping, I mean, nor loitering, neither seeking into things, but seeming to be quite at home as if she had known it from a child, and seeming, to my eyes at least, to light it up and make life and colour out of all the dullness, as I have seen the breaking sun do among brown shocks of wheat. But any one who wished to learn whether girls can change or not as the things around them change, while yet their hearts are steadfast and for ever anchored, he should just have seen my Lorna, after a fortnight of our life and freedom from anxiety. It is possible that my company, although I am accounted stupid by folk who do not know my way, may have had something to do with it, but upon this I will not say much, lest I lose my character. And indeed, as regards company, I had all the threshing to see to, and more than half to do myself, though any stranger would have thought that even John Fry must work hard this weather, else I could not hope at all to get our corn into such compass that a good gun might protect it. But to come back to Lorna again, which I always long to do and must long for ever, all the change between night and day, all the shifts of cloud and sun, all the difference between black death and brightsome liveliness, scarcely may suggest or equal Lorna's transformation. Quick she had always been, and pert, as we say on Exmoor, and gifted with a leap of thought too swift for me to follow, and hence you may find fault with much when I report her sayings. But through the whole had always run, as a black string goes through pearls, something dark and touched with shadow, coloured as with an early end. But now, behold, there was none of this. There was no getting her, for a moment even, to be serious. All her bright young wit was flashing like a newly awakened flame, and all her high young spirits leaped as if dancing to its fire. And yet she never spoke a word which gave more pain than pleasure. And even in her outward look there was much of difference. Whether it was our warmth and freedom, and our harmless love of God and trust in one another, or whether it were our air and water and the pea-fed bacon, anyhow, my Lorna grew richer and more lovely, more perfect and more firm of figure, and more light and buoyant with every passing day that laid its tribute on her cheeks and lips. I was allowed one kiss a day, only one for Mena's sake, because she was our visitor, and I might have it before breakfast, or else when I came to say good night, according as I decided. And I decided every night not to take it in the morning, but put it off till the evening time, and have the pleasure to think about through all the day of working. But when my darling came up to me in the early daylight, fresher than the day-star, and with no one looking, only her bright eyes smiling and sweet lips quite ready, was it likely I could wait and think all day about it? For she wore a frock of Annie's, nicely made to fit her, taken in at the waist, and curved, I never could explain it, not being a mantua-maker, but I know how her figure looked in it, and how it came towards me. But this is neither here nor there, and I must on with my story. Those days are very sacred to me, and if I speak lightly of them, trust me, tis with lip alone, while from heart, reproach peeps sadly at the flippant tricks of mind. Although it was the longest winter ever known in our parts, never having ceased to freeze for a single night, and scarcely for a single day, from the middle of December till the second week in March, to me it was the very shortest and the most delicious, and verily I do believe it was the same to Lorna. But when the Ides of March were come, of which I do remember something dim from school, and something clear from my favourite writer, lo, there were increasing signals of a change of weather one leading feature of that long cold, and a thing remarked by every one, however unobservant, had been the hollow moaning sound ever present in the air, morning, noon, and night-time, and especially at night, whether any wind were stirring, or whether it were a perfect calm. Our people said that it was a witch, cursing all the country from the caverns by the sea, and that frost and snow would last until we could catch and drown her. But the land being thoroughly blocked with snow, and the inshore parts of the sea with ice floating in great fields along, Mother Meldrum, if she it were, had the caverns all to herself, for there was no getting at her. And speaking of the sea reminds me of a thing reported to us, and on good authority, though people might be found hereafter who would not believe it, unless I told them that, from what I myself beheld of the channel, I place perfect faith in it. And this is, that a dozen sailors at the beginning of March crossed the ice with the aid of poles, from Clevedon to Penarth, or where the Holm rocks barred the floatage. But now, about the tenth of March, that miserable moaning noise, which had both foregone and accompanied the rigour, died away from out the air, 
and we, being now so used to it, thought at first that we must be deaf. And then the fog which had hung about even in full sunshine vanished, and the shrouded hills shone forth with brightness manifold. And now the sky at length began to come to its true manner, which we had not seen for months, a mixture, if I so may speak, of various expressions. Whereas till now from all hallows tide, six weeks ere the great frost set in, the heavens had worn one heavy mask of ashen grey when clouded, or else one amethystine tinge with a hazy rim when cloudless. So it was pleasant to behold, after that monotony, the fickle sky which suits our England, though abused by foreign folk. And soon the dappled softening sky gave some earnest of its mood, for a brisk south wind arose, and the blessed rain came driving, cold indeed, yet most refreshing to the skin, all parched with snow, and the eyeballs so long dazzled. Neither was the heart more sluggish in its thankfulness to God. People had begun to think, and somebody had prophesied, that we should have no spring this year, no seed-time, and no harvest, for that the Lord had sent a judgment on this country of England, and the nation dwelling in it, because of the wickedness of the court, and the encouragement shown to papists. And this was proved, they said, by what had happened in the town of London, where, for more than a fortnight, such a chill of darkness lay, that no man might behold his neighbour, even across the narrowest street, and where the ice upon the Thames was more than four feet thick, and crushing London Bridge in twain. Now to these prophets I paid no heed, believing not that Providence would freeze us for other people's sins, neither seeing how England could, for many generations, have enjoyed good sunshine, if popery meant frosts and fogs. Besides, why could not Providence settle the business once for all by freezing the Pope himself, even though, according to our view, he were destined to extremes of heat, together with all who followed him? Not to meddle with that subject, being beyond my judgment, let me tell the things I saw, and then you must believe me. The wind, of course, I could not see, not having the powers of a pig, but I could see the laden branches of the great oaks moving, hoping to shake off the load packed and saddled on them and hereby I may note a thing which someone may explain perhaps in the after-ages when people come to look at things. This is, that in desperate cold all the trees were pulled awry, even though the wind had scattered the snow-burden from them. Of some sorts the branches bended downwards like an archway, of other sorts the boughs curved upwards like a red deer's frontlet. This I know no reason for, but am ready to swear that I saw it. Now when the first of the rain began, and the old familiar softness spread upon the window-glass, and ran a little way in channels, though from the coldness of the glass it froze before reaching the bottom, knowing at once the difference from the short, sharp thud of snow, we all ran out and filled our eyes and filled our hearts with gazing. True, the snow was piled up now, all in mountains round us. True, the air was still so cold that our breath froze on the doorway, and the rain was turned to ice wherever it struck anything. Nevertheless, that it was rain, there was no denying, as we watched it across black doorways, and could see no sign of white. Mother, who had made up her mind that the farm was not worth having after all those prophecies, and that all of us must starve, and holes be scratched in the snow for us, and no use to put up a tombstone, for our church had been shut up long ago, Mother fell upon my breast and sobbed that I was the cleverest fellow ever born of woman. And this because I had condemned the prophets for a pack of fools, not seeing how business could go on if people stopped to hearken to them. Then Lorna came and glorified me, for I had predicted a change of weather, more to keep their spirits up than with real hope of it. And then came Annie, blushing shyly, as I looked at her, and told her that Winnie would soon have four legs now. This referred to some stupid joke made by John Fry or somebody, that in this weather a man had no legs and a horse had only two. But as the rain came down upon us from the south-west wind, and we could not have enough of it, even putting our tongues to catch it as little children might do, and beginning to talk of primroses. The very noblest thing of all was to hear and see the gratitude of the poor beasts yet remaining, and the few surviving birds. From the cow-house lowing came, more than of fifty milking times, moo and moo, and a turn-up noise at the end of every bellow, as if from the very heart of kine. Then the horses in the stables, packed as closely as they could stick at the risk of kicking, to keep the warmth in one another, and their spirits up by discoursing. These began with one accord to lift up their voices, snorting, snaffling, whinnying, and neighing, and trotting to the door to know when they should have work again. To whom, as if in answer, came the feeble bleating of the sheep, 
what few by dint of greatest care had kept their fleeces on their backs and their four legs under them. Neither was it a trifling thing, let whoso will say the contrary, to behold the ducks and geese marching forth in handsome order from their beds of fern and straw. What a goodly noise they kept, what a flapping of their wings and a jerking of their tails, as they stood right up and tried with a whistling in their throats to imitate a cockscrow. And then how daintily they took the wet upon their dusty plumes, and ducked their shoulders to it, and began to dress themselves, and laid their grooved bills on the snow, and dabbled for more ooziness. Lorna had never seen, I dare say, anything like this before, and it was all that we could do to keep her from rushing forth, with only the little lambs wool shoes on, and kissing every one of them. "'Oh, the dear things! Oh, the dear things!' she kept saying continually. "'How wonderfully clever they are! Only look at that one with his foot up, giving orders to the others, John!' "'And I must give orders to you, my darling,' I answered, gazing on her face so brilliant with excitement. "'And that is that you come in at once with that worrisome cough of yours, and sit by the fire and warm yourself.' "'Oh, no, John, not for a minute, if you please, good John. I want to see the snow go away, and the green meadows coming forth. And here comes our favourite Robin, who has lived in the oven so long, and sung us a song every morning. I must see what he thinks of it.' "'You will do nothing of the sort,' I answered very shortly.' being only too glad of a cause for having her in my arms again. So I caught her up and carried her in, and she looked and smiled so sweetly at me, instead of pouting as I had feared, that I found myself unable to go very fast along the passage. And I set her there in her favourite place by the sweet-scented wood-fire, and she paid me porterage without my even asking her, and for all the beauty of the rain I was fain to stay with her, until our Annie came to say that my advice was wanted. Now my advice was never much, as everybody knew quite well, but that was the way they always put it when they wanted me to work for them. And in truth, it was time for me to work, not for others, but myself, and, as I always thought, for Lorna. For the rain was now coming down in earnest, and the top of the snow being frozen at last, and glazed as hard as China cup, by means of the sun and frost afterwards, all the rain ran right away from the steep inclines, and all the outlets being blocked with ice set up like tables, it threatened to flood everything. Already it was ponding up like a tide advancing, at the threshold of the door from which we had watched the duck-birds, both because great piles of snow trended in that direction in spite of all our scraping, and also that the gully-hole where the water of the chute went out, I mean when it was water, now was choked with lumps of ice as big as a man's body. For the chute, as we called our little runnel of everlasting water, never known to freeze before, and always ready for any man either to wash his hands or drink, where it spouted from a trough of bark set among the white flint stones, this at last had given in, and its music ceased to lull us as we lay in bed. It was not long before I managed to drain off this threatening flood by opening the old sluice hole, but I had much harder work to keep the stables and the cow house and the other sheds from flooding. For we have a sapient practice, and I never saw the country round about our parts, I mean, of keeping all rooms underground, so that you step down to them. We say that thus we keep them warmer, both for cattle and for men, in the time of winter, and cooler in the summer time. This I will not contradict, though having my own opinion, but it seems to me to be a relic of the time when people in the western countries lived in caves beneath the ground, and blocked the mouths with neat skins. Let that question still abide, for men who study ancient times to inform me, if they will, all I know is that now we had no blessings for the system. If, after all their cold and starving, our weak cattle now should have to stand up to their knees in water, it would be certain death to them, and we had lost enough already to make us poor for a long time, not to speak of our kind love for them. And I do assure you, I loved some horses, and even some cows for that matter, as if they had been my blood relations, knowing, as I did, their virtues. And some of these were lost to us, and I could not bear to think of them. Therefore, I worked hard all night to try and save the rest of them. End of chapter 45 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, October 2008